Green Circle Headlines. Twin Circle Headline is a spontaneous discussion of the major issues of the day and the people who make them. Minor moderator Tom Davis, the question, or perhaps more properly, the debate over whether or not we ought to have sex education programs in the schools of America, public and private, rages on. The subject has become front page headlines in most publications in this country. The Wall Street Journal recently reported that the controversy is as bitter and emotional as any that ever rocked the nation's schools, and they report that sex education in America is in trouble. In an effort to help our audience gain a better understanding as to the pros and cons of this issue, we have invited as our guest this week Dr. James Lieberman. Dr. Lieberman is a diplomat in psychiatry of the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology, now with the National Institute of Mental Health, and an assistant professor of psychiatry at Howard University Medical School. He is a former member of the Board of Directors of SECUS, the Sex Education Information Council of the United States, and a proponent of sex education programs in our school. Here to welcome our guest is Father Daniel Lyons, author and journalist and our Twin Circle Headline editor. Father? Dr. Lieberman, how do you account for the great furor in this whole subject of sex education? I wish I could say why it erupted now so loudly. Uh, I think it's been an issue for a long time, but perhaps it's an idea whose time has come. In the past couple of years, we've seen uh, with the uh, development of the Sex Information Education Council and many, many requests from schools and communities around the country for help, uh, a, a wave of resistance also, so that the conflict is now full-blown. I think it's a healthy conflict, basically. Well, uh, what I think concerns uh, many people is when uh, people like Dr. Calderon, the leader in this field, will come out and write off all the Ten Commandments. Right away, she leaves out the Catholic, the Protestants, and the Jews. She says, I don't believe in the old thou shalt not. So she's uh, condoning adultery. She's condoning uh, immorality and so on. But she just uh, has a different standard. But I don't think she should impose those standards on the children of parents who do condemn adultery and so on. Well, I think that's a misstatement of Mary Calderon's position. I think Dr. Calderon talks about the need for dealing with uh, the relativism and the shifting value positions and the questioning and the and the uh, commercialism of sex and, an, and the, what she considers the hypocrisy of the, of the environment that children are raised in. But I don't think she wants to write off the Ten Commandments. Well, Doctor, she said exactly this. I don't believe in the old thou shalt not anymore. Now, uh, there's no way that you can get around that statement. She does not believe in, uh, in uh, that adultery is wrong. She doesn't believe in uh, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife and so on. She says, I don't believe in it. And, Doctor, it's not a misstatement. I'm saying this is exactly a quotation in quotation marks. There's no way that you can say she doesn't mean what she said. She's, she's willing to dispense with or discard the old thou shalt not. Well, as a psychiatrist interested in, in child psychology and behavior, I would say that that uh, thou shalt not uh, tend not to be very effective. And in that sense, uh, while I would like to retain uh, the moral precepts of the past, I'd like to make them more uh more poignant, more relevant, and more understandable. I think there's a reason why there are certain moral precepts, and I think that the thou, thou shalt not approach, the care approach, the don't do it or you'll get the D, or just like, you know, uh, uh, brush your teeth or they'll fall out. These kinds of, of um, approaches simply don't work. The kids turn their backs on the, on the adult generation, and... Um, Again, I can't speak for, for Dr. Calderon, but it's my impression that she's looking for a way to bridge the generation gap, not to throw out the moral precepts. At least uh, that's my position. Well, don't you feel that, uh, first of all, the vast majority of adults, you're familiar with adult society, the vast majority of married people uh, do not practice adultery. These people do not want their children to practice immorality. 
There seems to me an invasion of the rights of an individual child, an invasion of the parents' rights. If someone like Dr. Calderon goes on and says, well, it's perfectly all right. Well, this is uh, this has been going on for a uh, uh, long time. You only have to look on the uh, on the drugstore bookshelves to find out advocacy of many things we wouldn't want our kids to do, including uh, uh, murder and mayhem, uh, and uh, even on television. That is, it may not be so stated, but uh, I, I believe the message gets across. As I say, I don't think Mary Calderon condones or advocates adultery. Uh, I certainly don't. We know it does exist, however, in the society, and I think we, we have to find a way to talk to kids about some of these issues. Um, and I don't think it's sufficient to say don't do it. I think we have to say to kids, well, look, uh, uh, I read about it in this magazine or this newspaper or this book, and what do you have to say about it? And why not adultery? You know, why not uh, masturbation? Why not uh, premarital sex? I think we have to deal with these questions. Now, at home, the parents have every opportunity to make their views clear, both through words and through example, and they should. Uh, I don't think that uh, they can possibly be expert enough to give a good description of the function of the ovary and the testicle, to uh, talk about the menstrual cycle, to talk about uh, demography and population change, to talk about uh, uh, what is abortion, what are uh, nocturnal emissions, and so on. That is, they may be able to, some parents uh, will be able to, but uh, knowledge in the sex, sexual area changes also, and this is why I feel that the school has to supplement uh, home sex education. It should not supplant home values, but if the home values are reasonably well stated and reasonably well lived, I can't imagine that a school is going to overturn them. Doctor, do you believe, as a proponent of sex education, the subjects that you've just mentioned, masturbation, premarital sex, and so forth, require on the part of a teacher in the, in the process of instructing and training moral judgment. There's no escaping that these are morally loaded areas. And in the sense that the teacher's judgment is, is involved, I would say that uh, uh, his or her judgment um, has to be one which recognizes the social mores of this society, and she can communicate to kids. Um, what these are, she also, or, or he, has to recognize that uh, there are some violations of mores, and what does this mean? In other words, what, what brings a person to, to do what is wrong according to the society? And uh, that finally, uh, the teacher has to recognize that we're in a pluralistic society and that children from different homes, different backgrounds, different religions, will have different viewpoints on certain matters, including masturbation, birth control, okay. and abortion. So the teachers... You're, you're beginning to deal not only with moral ethical questions, but directly with religious questions, because there are, as you know, strong uh, feelings and regulations and rules within religious communities in this country oh, yeah. on these subjects. And Absolutely. I think one of the problems that comes up here is the question of how is a teacher going to handle these things if, in fact, we're not going to establish moral standards in our schools, how can we then deal with these subjects without permeating the atmosphere of the classroom with one's personal views? Well, it takes a good teacher, but uh, the problem is no greater, in my estimation, than the problem of, of dealing with a vegetarian child in a class or a Christian science child in a class when it comes to talking about meat as a food or when it comes to talking about going to the doctor. Uh, one doesn't want to violate the, the tenets of the uh, of the faith of a Christian scientist in that in that instant. So when it comes to discussing birth control in a class and wanting to pay respect to uh, not only ca Catholics but possibly Orthodox Jews who also have reservations about contraception, one simply has to say there are, there are religious viewpoints that feel all artificial contraception is, is wrong. And uh, in this way, in just saying this and in not, not saying this is uh, uh, that we have to impose one viewpoint over another, but that all all seriously held viewpoints of different groups have to be respected, uh, the teacher is imparting an even more important lesson, which is tolerance. A young man from Tempe, Arizona, his name is Randy McCarthy, writes in a letter to the editor column of the Look magazine. As you know, they recently carried a 
story, and I don't mean to make a generalization from one example, but I think it's relative. He says, I'm 16 years old and out of a class that had education and sex. And I remind you that I know all of these people very well. 23 are constant smokers, two were on drugs, 11 girls are now considered teenage whores, and all but a few of the boys would be fathers were it not for the progressive lessons they had on using contraceptives. Now, again, this is one individual. But if, if our society, a democratic society, is based on protecting everybody, uh, don't we need to protect him? Yes, that's, uh, I certainly think that uh, youngsters deserve protection. I think that uh, this includes not uh, prematurely bringing in issues such as we've talked about masturbation, contraception, abortion, uh, premarital sex, uh, adultery, and so on. These are topics, incest, rape, uh, uh, sex is, is loaded with uh, issues which are too difficult with, for many adults to cope with. Well. I don't think we should uh, talk about these things in kindergarten or nursery school or what have you. I know Dr. Calderon has been uh, charged with saying that we should. I think that that's a uh, misunderstanding. Well, there are, as you know, there have been in our today programs that exist K through 12, oh, yes. K through 12 in sex education. Doctor, we have to take a break for just this brief message. We will come back and continue. Our guest this week on Twin Circle Headline is Dr. Lieberman, psychiatrist, our subject, sex education in the schools. Dr. Lieberman, when the early advocates of sex education programs began, uh, perhaps they made a tactical error when, for example, Francis Spain said, don't uh, talk this over with teachers and faculty, because if you do that, you're opening the matter to discussion or putting it to a vote that would endanger the, the, the work. Uh, don't call for a democratic meeting of parents and let them discuss whether they want it. Dr. Kirkendall of Secus uh, sneaked the program into the school system. Don't you think these were bad tactical mistakes? Well, I certainly don't agree with that approach. Um, I can't uh, certify to uh, the positions of these people, but um, I think, as I said before, that the controversy is basically a healthy one. It has engendered a tremendous amount of interest by parents in their schools, and also among teachers and principals as to who is going to take on the, the responsibility of teaching in this area, which is a highly charged area. Um, I think that the discussion that's emerged is, is uh, by and large beneficial. I think there are some people who have other axes to grind uh, about uh, school systems in general. My own feeling is one of confidence in teachers and principals and the system and in parents to uh, to reach a conclusion which is consonant with, with the needs of children. And I, of course, believe that this will be some form of sex education program. Doctor, you have said that not all, teach, or, pardon me, not all parents are confident, and you gave the example of teaching about the menstrual cycle. Uh, the old system uh, that I was familiar with is where a doctor would be brought in to lecture. He would lecture to the girls separately and the boys separately. Uh, for one thing, it seems to me a great invasion of privacy uh, to lecture uh, to a mixed class of the young people about the menstrual cycle. I don't think this is a fit subject to have a, a mixed audience. But what percentage of teachers are competent to lecture about the menstrual cycle? Well, I would say uh, probably maybe 5%, 10%. But not every teacher has to do it. There has to be some teacher selection, just as we don't have every teacher teaching civics or geometry. 
so that some confidence has to be demonstrated. I, yes, I, well, I, I'm, uh, you, for example, are very confident to lecture on these subjects. Uh, you specialize. You've had unlimited education four years after your MD and so on. But when we say well, we're going to give 100 hours a year to everybody from kindergarten to high, through high school, obviously we're going to have those 95% of teachers teaching who are not any more competent than parents. And in fact, a lot of the teachers are not even married. We say, well, parents don't understand uh, sex, so we get a single teacher. Uh, I'm a single person. I'm a teacher. Why am I so much more qualified than parents? I'm not an MD. Oh, I think marital status is not a qualification for teaching anything. Uh, I well, think I mean, about sex, I think well, parents know how children arrive in this world. Oh, yes, I think uh, non-married people do also. In fact, I, I recall um, Father George Hagmeyer, who is on the board of uh, directors of SICUS, saying that uh, uh, every person is a sexual person in the sense of masculine or feminine, in the sense of, of human uh, orientation, and uh, their marital status is not as important as whether they can teach something well and that whether they can offer a point of view, because we want, we're, we're addressing ourselves to children, some of whom will be single. But are you saying that all teachers are unfit and unqualified to teach this, except 5% who are trained for that? Is that what you're well, saying? Well, I'm, I'm, giving, I'm giving a low figure, actually. I think it's, it's a larger figure than that. I, I, but, but uh, I'm giving a very conservative figure. Let's say there are only 5% of teachers or 10%. These are the ones that will teach the course, presumably. Now, in, in the in the educational utopia that I would hope for, all teachers would be able to handle the sexual aspects of their subject just as they would handle uh, uh, any any other kind of aspect. You wouldn't have to separate it out. But because sex has been singled out and, and excluded for so long, we have to kind of introduce it uh, with special attention now. But I think there are sexual aspects of art, of history, literature, social studies, even mathematics, if you will, but uh, because we can't uh, get to the, the total number of teachers, we have to start out with a few, and they have to take summer courses or they have to take in-service training uh, until they demonstrate that they can handle the menstrual cycle, they can handle uh, um, discussions about dating, discussions about... Uh, uh, the kinds of things that kids are concerned with. They have to be able to answer questions about homosexuality, for example, that, that, come, that come up in high school classes uh, uh, rather often. But uh, so many of these teachers have the relative view that is it meaningful and so on. And if you try to teach that about, uh, you gave the example of murder, you'd say, well, they see about it. But the teacher goes in and someone says, well, is it wrong to murder? And they pull out, oh, relativism, uh, is it meaningful to kill your grandmother and inherit her fortune? Is it meaningful to steal? What are you going to do with the money and so on? This is a, a perversion of the law, and it's a perversion of the rights of the parents that are trying to teach them absolute morality. Well, I see what you mean. Um, that, in a sense, you get into a conflict with, with at least some parents by raising the possibility that there is an, another uh, point of view on this. Um, I, I think that parents should probably have the right to withdraw their, their children from uh, specific educa sex education course. I think this is what was decided by the Maryland State. California and California and several other states. Yeah. Uh, I realize there's some burden placed on the child in this, but I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a tremendous one. I also think... It was an awful big burden in, in, in the case of uh, prayer in the school. Well, change the whole... It was, it was unconstitutional America. to say, well, I don't have to pray. But now isn't it unconstitutional to put that burden on that child of having well, to leave? I think it's... Uh, uh, actually a mistake for parents to think they have to withdraw their children because if their absolute position, look at uh, minority groups like the Amish or the Brethren, uh, they, they're not afraid, I mean, they have to expose their children to other points of view. And, uh, do, you think it was un do you think it was a mistake for the Supreme Court to say that we couldn't have prayer? I think the prayer uh, decision was a good one because um, I think uh, through prayer we get into uh, uh, an infringement on the rights of non-believers. All right. Now, what about the people who, who won't go along with what the, the teacher is teaching? They're non-believers on this relativism, which our teachers are shot through with. Oh, well, the te some, some are and some aren't. I think most uh, teachers are not relativistic. Most teachers are conservative parents. I mean, by conservative, they're, they're cautious. They, they're church-going. They're responsible me members of the community. We know that children get their sex education mainly from other kids. 
That's the biggest single source of sex information. And then, of course, they get all the innuendos from, from the mass media and so on. And therefore, I, I would elevate the teacher, even though the teacher might not, but they agree with exactly your precepts or mine, I would still say that teacher is going to do a much better job of stopping misinformation and of upholding the values of the society than, than most sources that the kids have. But Dr. you say presumably it's going to be these 10% that are qualified that will teach. But you know, this is a very false presumption. Well, well I think 90% of the teachers are better mm -hmm. sources of sex information than the sources the kids have now. So, But you, you've said that only 10% are qualified. I would say by my standards in terms of really saying, now this teacher really knows, really is well prepared, prepared and, and can you know train other teachers and really be, be uh, uh, ideally suited, yes. And I think we've got enough to start responsible, good sex education programs. My argument would be that, that we can do more with the imperfect pro programs possible today than, than we're doing by leaving them out. But, but you I seem to, uh, to feel that it's far better to have one outstanding teacher teach, say, in a grade school of 500 students in their uh, 8 or 10, 12 classes, that one well-trained teacher would do a better job uh, at a certain time uh, of the year in each class than having 10 or 12 untrained teachers. Uh, that would be my inclination. I would say that if 10% if of the teachers, and there are 20 teachers in the school, then I would say the principal would line up two teachers, uh, send them to uh, some kind of in-service training program, or uh, perhaps they're already qualified because they're health educators or or uh, home economics teachers or something, and uh, or biology, and uh, these teachers would do the bulk of the teaching of such things as, as you mentioned, the doctor coming into the school. There aren't enough doctors to go into all the classrooms. Therefore, you've got to have the biology teacher or, or the, as far as I'm concerned, the English literature teacher, if that person is competent with, with, the, with the scientific knowledge. Dr. Liebman, I'm sorry to interrupt you again. We have to take another break. We'll come back with a concluding portion right after this. Dr. Lieberman, I, I, in doing a fair amount of reading on this subject, I, I've come upon a question that I can't answer. I'd like to ask you, what is the relationship or the connection between sex education programs in the schools and efforts at uh, population control in this country, specifically relieving us of the problem of uh, relief and welfare? Mm. Well, population control in this country is an issue. President Nixon spoke to it very recently. It's not just an issue of the poor because... Um, uh, larger families among the well-to-do also use up the resources that we have, and as a matter of fact, there is a question as to whether uh, the country now uh, over 200 million is going to have 300 million by by the year 2000, whether our standard of living will go down simply because of the number of people. Now, well, my, my question, doesn't yes. a larger family replace the resources that it uses if it's an affluent, in an affluent situation Un or upper middle class? Unfortunately not, because uh, as we're finding out, uh, the people uh, will use up some of the irreplaceable resources to, uh, of the environment, and they will also pollute the environment more. So we have this kind of a problem. But the relationship of sex education here is uh, that um, uh, uh, the difference, I suppose, between the, the conjugal and reproductive functions of sex, that is, the marital, the expression of love, on the one hand. Well, in other words, are we talking about sex education, or in fact, is that not the problem? Is it really a question we're going to try to control the population? I ask you that oh. because uh, one of the officials of Planned Parenthood says that sex education in its total concept is total contraception. Alice Taylor Day, whom I'm sure you know, says that if we're to curb our growth within the context of our present democratic values, the problem comes down to the willingness of American couples voluntarily to keep down the number of children. But if that doesn't happen, compulsory sterilization, uh, one year we'll sterilize all male babies. Next year 
You'll be fined fifty dollars if you have a child. I is this the real reason for sex education in school? Absolutely not. I think that uh, people, in order to achieve the number of children that they want, need to know something about sex and contraception. On the other hand, even if they want many, many children, they still need to know something about marital sex that will enable them to have a better marriage. And we know that a lot of marriages falter in this country, and a lot of it has to do with, with inadequate uh, sex understanding, sex information. So I see two things. One is the improvement of the sex life of people, and the other is how do you deal with the reproductive issues that our society faces, which include population control and family planning, and sex education is relevant to both, it's relevant to mental health, and it's relevant to public health in the sense of population growth. Well, Doctor, uh, as a psychiatrist, you, I'm sure, have seen uh, remarks by other uh, psychiatrists and psychologists who say that they are being flooded with uh, children who are driven to perversion by the, the shock of this raw sex that's being dished out. Uh, privacy is destroyed. Uh, modesty is destroyed. If only to read about this professor at the University of Minnesota who teaches him to shout all the most obscene words they can think of, destroy... Uh, all this, and then say, this is what animals do, and this is what your parents do, and these kids become perverts in some cases. I don't see how we're accomplishing much with that. Well, uh, uh, Doctor, I'm awfully sorry, but we've just run out of time. I wish we had more time, Doctor. I think our approach to this has to be we're going to have to proceed cautiously. Dr. Lieberman, thank you very much for coming, being our guest, and helping us write this week's Twin Circle headlines. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize. <laughs> For a transcript of today's program, write to Twin Circle Headline, 86 Riverside Drive, New York, New York, 10024.